Is there a lot of tension in your home? Like, hello, like Leia, this is just, I can't take it anymore. I'm frustrated. I'm annoyed. I'm resentful. Help. Okay. If that's you, stay tuned. We have an amazing, amazing human being. I'm telling you, blown away. It's Rabbi Reuven Epstein. And he is going to tell us step by step how to remove or reduce. So Fried said, I said, let's call it extra. Let's kill all the, the tension in the house. She goes, that doesn't sound realistic. We're going to reduce tension by mm-hmm. a lot. Stay tuned. This is Leah Richheimer for the Ladies Talk Show. And we are I'll be right with you. Welcome back, everybody. We have an amazing show for you. And Rabbi Ruvain Epstein, he's the head of the Marriage Pro. And he is just, he's got so much wisdom. He, he also helps with dating, which I think is like amazing, like getting them dated and getting them married and whatever. He's got this amazing program on his website. He's got lots of free classes. He's fantastic. And you will see that right now. Rabbi, welcome to the show. So happy to have you with us. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we go very fast, deep. Okay, so I hope to forgive, forgive me, but I just want to say, like this reducing tension in in your home that sounds like lovely fairyland, fairy t- airy fairy, like not happening. Like, yeah, right. So, can you just tell us, like, is it even possible? And then I hope you're going to tell us step by step because it seems impossible. Like, it's the middle of COVID. We got all the kids at home. It's the summer, and we have the Yentif is coming. Are you out of your mind? Reduce tension, not happening. So, please uh, uh, enlighten okay. us. <laughs> okay, so. Let's, we're going to go step by step, but I have to tell you something. Um, I'm involved with, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of marriages. And I'm going to tell you that I believe really strongly that the average marriage, the thing that makes it between good and bad is literally split second decisions. It's not like years and years and tens of thousands of dollars. It's literally a few seconds between greeting your spouse one way versus the other way, appreciating what they did one way versus the other way. And what we find is that it's not like, oh my gosh, I have to buy my wife a new car and a new house and a new husband and a new vacation. (laughs) And and I have to get myself like everything in order for them to be happy. It's really not true. It's really, really cheap and easy to just, instead of making a left turn, to make a right turn. And I'm going to walk you through what I believe to be the average couple, where they go wrong on a regular day, I'm not talking crazy, just a regular day why the average couple, they're just fighting, there's tension, they're yelling at each other. You know, everybody always says, don't go to sleep angry. And then I've heard from people, well, I just, I can never go to sleep because we're just always in a fight, <laughs> right? We're always arguing with each other. We can't stop. And they're up till three, three o'clock in the morning. And then the next morning they're fighting. Why did you get up late? Well, it's your fault. It's my fault. It just never ends. So I'm going to walk you through the way I see with so many couples that I'm counseling this is where they go wrong. Okay, you ready? I'm dr- drum roll. We need it. Let's do this. Okay, <laughs> okay let's go. Okay. Let's do this. All right. So, the average man, he he thinks he's doing a great job. Okay, men think they're doing great jobs because we have two they're thumbs. Nodding. They're like, oh yeah. <laughs> right. We have two thumbs, and we say, who's got two thumbs and is doing a great job? This guy. So we're very thrilled. We think we're doing an amazing job because we get up in the morning. And we go out to Davin and to learn, we go to work and we slave away for eight, 10, 12 hours, right? You might be an accountant like me. You might be working on a roof in 120 degree weather. And we're like, I'm killing myself for my family. I'm doing an amazing job. I'm great. And we come home, we're pooped, we're exhausted. We walk in the door and we're just thinking of one thing, two things. We're thinking of a bed. <laughs> we're thinking of food and that's what we're thinking of. So we're, we're like walking in the door. Okay. And that's the average guy. And we're thinking to ourselves, like, I, I am just so good at what I do. My wife is just lucky to be married to me. And we come in the door and that is not what greets us. Okay. So we come home and there's kids and there's Legos and the food is not ready. And the house is a little bit chaotic. And the wife is sitting there and she's like, oh, look who decided to show up. Right? It takes like that split second. Now, why? Why does that happen? Why does that happen? I'm going to tell you why. Okay. So I, I don't want to say that I've cracked the code of women because I don't think there's anybody who can claim that. But I'm going to tell you something that I really believe Hashem gave women an amazing, amazing intuition, which is why most marriage complaints originate with women. Statistically, nationwide, like 80% of marriage complaints come from women. My phone is blowing up all day. It's, it's, it's the women. 
I, the men come into the meeting by me and they're like, what are we doing here exactly? Oh, you deal with marriages? Wait, my marriage? That like I'm here for you. Are you serious? That's <laughs> what's going laughing. on. <laughs> right? That's that's the average man. We're like, you're not really talking to me. I'm doing an amazing job. Why are you fetchy so much? Why are you complaining so much? Like there must be something wrong with my wife. She's so naggy. She's so needy. They're diagnosing her. I think there's something wrong with her because I'm great. I'm wonderful. And women are really smart. And what women have this intuition is that they realize that the opposite of a good marriage is not a bad marriage. I'm gonna explain to you what I mean. What is a good marriage? A good marriage, the Torah says, is the word davak. Davak means to be connected, it means literally to cling, but it means to have a connection. And the way that it works is that when women sense a disconnection, a coexistence, they go crazy because they're hardwired for deep, meaningful connection. So men, they think they're doing a great job because they're working on behalf of their family. But women, they sense that while you're working on behalf of the family as a whole, it would almost be like somebody having a phone and having a charger. And then saying like, I got the phone, I got the charger, so therefore the phone's got to be charged. But it's not. And just like a phone has batteries, women have batteries. So they're sensing the whole day that the phone and the charger are right next to each other, but they're not plugged in because your husband didn't check up on you. He didn't compliment you this morning. He didn't really connect to you and give you what you need emotionally. So by the time he walks in the door, your batteries, just like a phone battery, it's starting to die. So it's like 50%, 40%, 30%. And he walks in the door and he's thinking, my wife's got to be just the luckiest lady in the world. <laughs> and he doesn't see what's coming at him, which is a woman whose batteries are totally depleted because she just worked with the kids and she couldn't get supper ready on the table and she knows he's going to be frustrated and she had to do carpool. And she had a million things going on. So her batteries start to flash and they start to beep. And the women, as soon as he walks in the door, because women are so intuitive, they're really mean to say, this is the difference. They mean to say, honey, wow, you worked so hard today. You must be starving. Thank you so much for all that you do. Instead of that, he's greeted by, oh, look who decided to come home or, right? or something to the effect of like something snappy or she's quiet or she's angry or she's seeking out a compliment. And the guy's like missing all the cues because he's in his own world. He's hungry. He's starving. And that's where things start to go downhill. So in my experience, it's those few seconds of just recognizing that what's going on is that your phone batteries are starting to die. And just like your phone starts to emit sounds, you are emitting sounds. That's what's going on, you're emitting sounds. And when your phone starts to get to critical levels, it starts saying the following apps will no longer work. That's when women say the following apps will no longer work. Dishes, laundry, garbage, they all start, those apps start work, they're not working anymore. And the men are like, what's going on over here? And when they start, when women start complaining to their husbands, they feel like they're being underappreciated, not respected. They feel like they're under attack and they take it very personally. Like, what do you mean? How could it be possible that I'm not doing a great job? I feel like I'm working so hard for you. And the women are like trying to verbalize it, but it usually doesn't come out in the right way. And that is the number one, I believe, mistake that women make is that if you were smart, you would just recognize what is going on you'd recognize what's going on. What's going on is I really feel depleted. And rather than attacking my husband, why should I attack the guy? He's so great. He's so good. Yeah, he's not 100% in tune to me. But if I yell and scream and, and, and shut down and just give him the silent treatment, he's not going to give me what I really need. So how do I get what I really need? I compliment him. I build him up. And in two seconds, you can change your whole relationship from taking a left turn to arguing and fighting all night about why he's not giving you. Is he really giving you? What is he giving you? They're just turning and saying, wow, you know, you really worked so hard today. I feel like we could use like an iced coffee. Maybe we should go for a walk tonight. Like that little change, that two seconds of just getting in control of what you're feeling to what you're actually trying to explain to your spouse. It's, it's the difference between like five hours of bliss and five hours of just Horrible. walking on eggshells. Yeah, nobody knows they're coming or going. Wow. Is this gorgeous? Is this yeah. gorgeous? Okay, so here's yeah. uh, here's the thing. I totally get it. 
how in when a woman is there's nothing left of her the kids are screaming the how there's legos everywhere there you know whatever the, the ha- everything's flying and they also you know he forgot their birthday and he t- said something mean to them in front of their mother-in-law and you know there's all this resentment and whatever like the the words uh, oh you must have worked hard today dear uh we should go for iced coffee ain't happening. So what, <laughs> how do you get to that place, Rabbi? It's, it's, you, I, I totally am with you and you nailed it. Like, you're not, I, I don't know how you got in that your wife must be an amazing communicator to be explained to, that you totally nailed what a woman is feeling, uh, you know, uh, and a guy it's, it's, it's edifying for us women. But the question is, uh, it sounds like fantasy land, a beautiful fantasy land. So I want to tell you something. So I'm an accountant, right? right? I have, we won't go through the numbers. You know, I'm a numbers guy, but Baruch Hashem, you know, we have a, a nice size practice and we have a lot, you know, a lot of um, clients and during tax season, it gets really, really hectic. The phones are lit up. The emails are coming through like crazy. And it was a few years ago. So my wife actually works with me in our, in our accounting firm. Okay. So it's not for everybody, but for us, Baruch Hashem, you know, thank God it works very, very nicely. So we were working and this was, I would say five, six years ago. Now I'm a partner in the firm, right? So I have all my people who are working for me and I was walking around and my wife turns to me and she says, can I talk to you outside for a second? I was like, yeah, of course we go outside. And my wife says, your energy, the stress that you're feeling is like feeding out to the, to, to the people around us. I said, what do you mean? She's like, well, you, you could tell that you're very stressed and the people who work for you, the employees, they're sensing the stress. I said, well, it is stressful. She said, listen, you're the boss. Now my wife could talk to me like this, okay? And she said it in a very nice way, but she said, you're the boss. And the boss is in charge of the office. And I would say the same thing to every woman. If you're a woman, you are in charge of your home. The temperature in your home is yours. You get to decide if you're going to be operating in chaos or if it's going to be calmer. You get to decide if you get angry or if you don't get angry. It's not fantasy land. This is every Jew gets up every morning and says, how can I be a better person? This would be something that if women wore tefillin, I'd say, as you put on your tefillin, you should say this every morning. My job is to lower the temperature in my home so that my husband, he feels it, that my children, they feel it. The environment of the home is your domain. And you have the ability to lower the temperature so that your husband, at the end of the day, he wants to come home. I always say, the, the, I, tell, I tell people all the time, I deal with a lot of couples. Many of them are very in distress, let's call it. You know, I always say it's like touch and go, but it's less touch and more go. You know, <laughs> like, like things are not necessarily always so great, right? <laughs> things are not great. And I always tell, I always tell um, women, I say, you know, at the end of the day, your husband, he could be in the worst mood and he'll say, I love you because I love you. He was programmed to say he was taught from when he was really young to say, I love you. I love you. I love you. You want to know if a man really loves you. He's not going to say the words. I love you. He's going to say, I had the craziest day today. I just couldn't wait to see you. Or it's so chaotic here in the office. Could we make a few minutes tonight? Because what he's telling you is you're doing your job and he is doing his job. He's sensing that lack of connection, that disconnection. And he's saying to you, I want to connect. And if you open that portal to connect, he will connect with you. So So I want to know, Rabbi, when your wife told you that and you went back into the room, I want to know the nitty gritty. What how did you shift who you were being to lose the tension as the accountant, as the boss of everybody? Uh, It was the most stressful time of the year. And, 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 you know, lots on your head and uh, lots writing on it. How were you able to make that transition in that moment to be who? And who did you become? Who did you? yeah, I'll tell you. I'll okay. tell you. OK, I, I, I shifted in my in my professional life to change up. I got a personal assistant. She handles all the chaos, all the emails, all the phone calls, all the craziness. She handles my whole schedule. So everything runs like clockwork. And I'm able to sit back and, and make decision after. We all know men are bad at multitasking. Right. So I'm, I'm the worst. I one thing at a time. So I realized that the thing that was causing me the stress was all this craziness, the, the million emails flying. I muted all my work notifications and everything just goes straight to her. She's trained. She's really, really great. And she runs my whole life. So that shift, I walk into the office and I'm humming a happy tune. I'm happy to come to work. And the people around me are also, they're not sensing that stress. 
I hope, you know. Okay, so how do you translate that to a <laughs> No, no, yeah. So basically, Leia, the Rob Epstein is saying that every woman needs a personal assistant. There you go. So <laughs> <laughs> we all need someone who's a cook would be nice also. <laughs> a cook. <laughs> yeah. If you need if you need cleaning help, of course, you should have cleaning help. If you need help with your children, of course. But at the end of the day, it comes down to priorities. The end of the day comes down to priorities. So if your priority, let's, 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 re, let's roll reverse over here, right? Men think they're doing a great job by working for their wives when they're not necessarily doing a great job as a husband, because he's not necessarily giving her exactly what she wants from him, the time, the affection, the compliments, she's not necessarily getting it. Flip that around. Do you think your husband really, really cares about the things that you're busy with all day? Or would he rather come home to a happy wife? Would he rather come home to somebody who took care of herself, who's calm, who says, oh, you had such a hard day, sit down. W what do you think he wants? But how can you be that person when you're frazzled? Why are you frazzled? Your, your, first pri your first priority, this is what I'm explaining, your first priority has to be your mental health. Your, the way that you go about your day, the first thing you got up in the morning, you have to say, I have to learn to work on my stress, to, 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 to know that 20 minutes before my husband comes home, I have to take care of myself, I should get dressed up. You know, I want to tell you, there's a Revitson who I know, a Rebitson who I know, okay? And I'm not, I won't mention any details. This Rebitson, every time before her husband come home, would come home, he would, he would teach in yeshiva, he would come home. At around five o'clock, let's say he came home at 5.15, at five o'clock, whatever she was doing, she would stop. She would say, I gotta go. She would hang up her phone. People were there. She'd say, I'm sorry, you know, it's time for you to go. My husband's coming home soon. She would go upstairs. She would freshen up. She'd put on heels. She would put on makeup. She would go downstairs and she would say, like literally waiting for the door for her husband to come home. That's what it is. It's a priority. It takes a second, right? It takes 10 and minutes, 15 it's, minutes. It's so, it's so interesting, by the way, Leah, that um, Rabbi Estin said that because it's, it's so true. I, I found even in my own life that I got so busy with stuff that I felt needed to get done. You know, like I needed to do this in the house. Or I need to clean that thing. Or I need, and end of day, my husband didn't care. But by the end of day, I was so tired and I was so exhausted that I couldn't deal with him because I was just like, oh, okay, just take the baby, take this, whatever. I, I've done so much. And he's like, but who, who am I really doing it for? I'm not doing it for him. I'm doing it almost selfishly. And the result will be us having sort of that strain and that tension in the marriage. So it's so true. We can just like let go of some of that. Right. So the question is how we grow into that. You know, I, you know, we, we're here and Rabbi saying this is where this is the goal. You know, so there's like this, this, uh, you it's, know, it's not a mountain. It's not a mountain. Focus, focus on initial contact. Let's start with that initial contact. Whatever time your husband is coming home, focus on again, if the place is crazy because the kids just came home, then don't focus on that. But focus on how you're dealing with the crazy. If you know that he, he prefers to have food when he comes home, so then try to have that ready. If he wants you to be put together, so focus, focus on what you think your husband would appreciate walking in the door. Whatever that thing is, that will, will it like bridges the gap between his work and now he's like transitioning into the home. How many women say, oh, my husband comes home and he's always on the phone and he's always texting and he's like, he's not checked out of the office yet. But very often the reason is because he walks in the door there's nobody there to like greet him, meaning they're throwing things at him. So he's like, I'd rather be I'd rather be working and in the chaos of the work than sitting down and talking to somebody because there's really nobody home to talk to. You know, there's always two sides to the story. So I would say focus on the initial contact. Initial contact is the difference between a right turn and a left turn. And if you can make that right turn right from the beginning, usually you'll see he'll be like, oh, oh, oh yeah. Hey, how are you? He'll put his phone down. He'll talk to you. He'll sit with you. And it's very interesting because I recently got like a like a super fast charger for my phone. Right, you put plug it in, and in like 15 minutes, your phone is like 50 percent full. People are like that also. You don't need 15 hours of your of your spouse's time. They give you a good 15, 20, 30 minutes of like real quality. You're like, okay, you're good. I'm good. We're good. Now let's get back to the craziness. The kids need to get be bathed, and they have to go to sleep. Then you can focus on the other things. Wow. Well, Leia, it's so it's like so connect we can so connect with what's being said but what what's being asked is what about a woman who's working outside the house and she's also meaning she's not this sounds a lot like someone who's let's say home but let's say a woman who she's really coming home just maybe a few minutes before her husband or maybe even the same time as her husband meaning it's like the, they're both in that same work world 
Yeah, it's, uh, I'll tell you. So it, it, there's sometimes, it's funny, a lot of times I deal with people who, let's say, are night nurses, you know, like in a hospital and their schedules are just so helter skelter. So the answer is, is that you have to find what works for you. I mean, whatever timing the two of you as a couple are able to, let's call it, recharge your batteries, that's when you have to do it. See, I'm going to tell you what I think most women, where they struggle. Okay, I'm going to tell you where, you where I think women really struggle. Tell me if I'm right, okay? Because okay. obviously I'm not a woman, but I, I think they have this figured out to a degree, okay? Women run into this catch-22. All right, hear me out. What they do is like this. They say, I really, really, really want my husband to be proactive because when men are proactive, it's worth like 10 to one, a hundred to one. Meaning if a guy comes in the door and he says, you know, I was on the way home and I know that you like uh, whatever Reese's peanut butter cuffs. And I stopped in the pharmacy and they sell it under the counter and I bought one for you. And you're just the greatest wife ever. I mean, most women, they would melt. How much does a Reese's peanut butter cups cost? A dollar? It's nothing. But the fact that he proactively did something for you, it's, it's golden, right? It's golden. On the other hand, if let's say before it's, it's before Yontif or whatever, and you turn to him and you say, you know, it's before Yontif, you, you should be buying me jewelry. And he's like, really? Okay, fine. I guess I'll go with you. And you end up with like a $5,000 necklace. The Reese's peanut butter cup is more valuable because it came from within. It's a real expression of him prioritizing you and being proactive and giving you really what you need, right? We, we agree with this idea, right? If you have to squeeze it out of him, you might like the necklace, but, but you're gonna, you're, there's going to be a part of you, if you have a, like a pure soul, that's going to say, I really wish I didn't have to do that. I, I don't want favors. I don't want a pity party. I wanted my husband to proactively get this for me. So I'm right, here. Elena, you say the exact same thing because you say him doing it is an A plus compliment. Right, that's exactly what I was going to say. Is a B plus. Yeah, so yeah, how we? That's exactly how I is that it's a, it's that's like it's an A shining. But women so much depend. You know, they're mad at their husband and resentment and angry for decades because he isn't giving him the, the giving her those A pluses. And what right. I teach women to do, and the, I have resources for this, uh, which Rabbi may know, is that they they need to solicit. It be compliments because they need they need more that if they wait for a plus compliments all the time they're going to be very miserable so be instead of just waiting for him to say this meal was delicious saying the soup came out pretty good or you know what do you you know like that so yeah right we're on the right page. right so i i think i think that a lot I, very good i think that that's where a lot of women go wrong in that they know that their husband is not necessarily giving them a hundred percent and they shoot for the moon, meaning they're just like waiting for him to walk in the door and sweep her off her feet and say, wow, everything's amazing. Yeah. And in, instead, when that when that expectation falls short, they don't say to him, wow, you know, you really worked so hard today. I would really appreciate if we could just, you know, go for a walk or something. And men are funny. Like when you teach us something and it, it happens three, four, five times, it just becomes a thing. Like my wife was talking to a certain woman. She would, oh, every time her husband would come home, she would say, you never spend time with me. Why don't we go out for a walk? Every time I cut, you know, she was like always nagging her husband for, you know, for a walk. And my wife said to her, stop, stop, stop. Like, you don't realize how heavy you sound and how naggy you sound. I'm telling you, just stop. And after a while, like one day he came home and he said to her, you know, like, I had such a crazy day. Like, can we just go out for a few minutes for a walk? And she texted my wife. She was so happy. She's like, he like, he connected the dots, like, oh my goodness. And then this couple just, they just started. Like every time he would come home, he said, let's just go out for 10 minutes. Let's just go out for 10 minutes. And it, it became longer and it became date night. So like a lot of times when you teach him and he learns like, you know, you're not giving me this, you're giving me something else. It, it's channeling. You, you're bringing something into the relationship that he's able to relate to. And it's just, it's, it's beautiful when it actually like grabs hold. That's awesome. I, my next question is, how do you make your husband want to come home? I get this question a lot of women who's like, you know, like, and then he, if he comes home, he eats dinner and then whatever, he spends, a, you know, like a perfunctory amount of time with the kids. Am I using the right word? Perfunctory. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, and, and then he's off learning and he's off with his, he always says, oh, I need to get stuff at Costco and he disappears. How do you get a husband to, and we, I see we have questions coming in, but maybe answer this one first. Yeah. It's it's very simple. I, you know, I was talking to a woman recently who was complaining about her husband and she was saying exactly what you're saying. You know, he comes in, he like dashes in, dashes out, he eats, he eats dinner in two seconds. Is, I said, I have a question for you. If you were married to you, would you want to spend time with you? 
And she said, nope, I would be out of here so fast. I would be out the door. At least she's honest. At least she's honest. She was very honest. So I I spent like a half hour talking to her about her structure and her home and what she can do differently that her husband would want to. It's very simple. Make sure that if you just ask that one question, meaning I don't like complicating things. Ask that one question. What? Would you want, if you came in the door after working or whatever your husband's schedule is, whether he's learning, whether he's working, whether he's in school, whatever, whatever he's doing, what would he want when he comes in the house? He'd want a wife who's put together. He would want a house that's put together. He would want food. And then again, if he's missing the cues, like he just doesn't get it because he thinks like, oh, I want to run out to Costco. So like, oh, it's so sweet. You want to run out to Costco for me. And I would really appreciate if we could go for a walk instead and I'll go to Costco tomorrow. Or if you can reschedule the Costco because I would I would like this. I had a couple. I'll tell you a true story. I had a woman who every every Matzah Shabbos, every Saturday night, her husband went ahead and he goes ahead and he's cleaning the dishes. So this was a guy who came to me. He wasn't let's just say he wasn't really checked into his marriage. Okay. So we were speaking about giving to your wife and doing, you know, what she would appreciate. So he goes first Matzah Shabbos, the first Saturday night, he goes, he rolls up his sleeves. Okay. Kudos. Cause I don't really wash dishes myself. Okay. And he starts scrubbing the dishes and his wife went crazy on him. You're washing the dishes. Who's washing the dishes? This is not how you wash a dish. You're using the warm water. You're supposed to use the hot water. She's like giving it to him over the head. So she called me up and she's telling me about, you know, what happened. I said, I don't understand. The guy's trying. Can you try to channel? And here's like a tool I tell women all the time. What does it mean to channel? Turn to your husband and say to him, wow, you are so awesome that you're finally trying after 25 years (laughs) to do something. I really sincerely appreciate it. I see what you're trying to do. What would be a huge help is if you go down to the basement and you can clean up toys or clean up the Legos or or whatever, meaning just, just show him, connect the dots. So like men, I, I don't think there's many men who don't want to be good husbands. I think we just think that we're better than we really are because we're not really giving what the women are appreciating. But if your husband is doing something, which they are, he's working, he doesn't, he doesn't enjoy work. He's working for you. He's taking care of the kids for you. He's doing carpool for you or whatever he's doing, if he's doing anything. So first show him that you appreciate what he's actually doing. And then if there's something that he's not doing, if it's done with love, you can, you can totally, you can totally shift his focus and he'll continue to give to you. You know, I learned by Yitzhak Berkowitz and Yitzhak Berkowitz is one of the greatest people in the world. And he always says that the mitzvah of the Ahav Delarei HaKamocha, that you love your fellow Jew like you love yourself, has many offshoots. And one of them is giving tochacha, it's giving rebuke. What does that mean? Giving rebuke usually sounds like me and you are fighting and loving somebody is I just love you. And he says, no, it's exactly the same thing because when you really love someone, you're like, I love you. You really need to stop doing that. When it's really coming from love, the person accepts the rebuke. They're like, oh my gosh, thank you for telling me that. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that was detrimental for me. So you first have to love and then you can criticize, but the person has to feel the love. So anytime you want to change your husband, criticize him, do something, if he's not feeling the love, you're just going to get into a huge fight. If he feels like, wow, you're the greatest guy and you're so amazing. And then, you know, I really would appreciate that. You don't have to say, but, and, and, you know what I find with a lot of people, they're, they're the nicest. They're like the nicest jerks, meaning they, they say they it's so sweet and, and it's so passive, but what they're saying is so toxic to a relationship. Like, you're not really building up your spouse. You're like, honey, dear, you're terrible. You're not really giving me anything. So guys like, okay, you said it very softly. That's very, that's a step, but you're, you're, you're killing me. You're destroying me. It's not a war. It's a cold war. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not shooting guns. You're, I can tell that there's tension. I can tell that I'm walking on eggshells. I always ask this to women. Does your husband feel like he's walking on eggshells around you? Like, maybe <laughs> like if, again, if you're honest with it, yeah, maybe. So then take out those eggshells, let him come well, home. How do you do that? Because I mean, isn't that, you know, when women ask me that, I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. I'm like, yeah, you should walk on eggshells about around everybody in your life. That's your job is to walk on eggshells, to not hurt anybody that we, we have a thing. You are not meant to hurt another human being. So, you know, that you should walk on eggshells. I, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know. But not, to- not tense, not in a tense way, meaning you should be mindful not to hurt anybody, but who should you be more mindful 
than than your spouse. I get right? it. Good. Okay. <laughs> than well, your spouse. Yeah, and Everyone, also, he said he said the husband shouldn't walk on eggshells. So <laughs> Yeah. I'm I'm talking about in your house, in your house, meaning in a woman's house, if your husband's walking on eggshells around the woman, like around his wife. That's not good. That has to change. And that's attitude. That is just an atti- attitude adjustment. It doesn't cost any money and it takes a few seconds. How do you do the attitude adjustment? And I want to get back to the question of how do you make your husband want to come home? So answer those two. So uh, first of all, I, I don't I don't believe th- there's they used to. I, I, I always like to say that they used to teach that you just have to be Mavatar, which means you just have to give in to everything. I find that people who are just mavater, they become shmaters, meaning like you just like giving, giving, giving in, and then you're just like ready to explode. So I don't believe in that philosophy. I think obviously times you have to let things slide, but you should be able to have a conversation with your husband, but like on a 10 to one positive to negative talk, meaning how like when guys talk to me about how their wives are so bad, I'm like, when was the last time you gave her a card? Uh, years. When was the last time you bought her a gift? Uh, years. When was the last time you took her on a date? Uh, years. So of course, of course, she's not happy. Of course, she's not happy. You just have to flip the script. When was the last time you got something for him? When was the last? You understand? It, it, it's not rocket science. It's literally it's the initial contact. It's the compliments. And it's not like compliment, compliment, boom, compliment, compliment, boom. That's what a lot of people do. You know, they think like if I maybe if I compliment, then I could really just like sucker punch him, you know, like he won't see it coming. And then he'll like miraculously change. He's not going to change. He's not going to change. The best change, by the way, the best change is when the person doesn't feel the change. It's like dieting, right? When you get up in the morning, like I'm on a diet. I don't mean to say it. You're not going to lose any weight. It's, it's when it's when you're doing it so organically and it's just like so in the background, like, oh, you're just like making decisions that are healthy and smart and you're exercising. You don't feel like it's like a burden. That's when you just change your lifestyle and you change your lifestyle. You change your life. Right. Wow. Wow. God. OK, so explain how how you get a husband to want to be at home. I mean, it's been talking about the whole show, but I want to like a few six. six yeah, I would say focus on prepare. First of all, you have to prepare for anything in life that you want to be successful. You have to prepare. So take a few minutes before he comes home. And even before that, strategize, pick two or three things that you know that he would appreciate on that initial contact. Set your expectation low to, let's say, 15 minutes after he comes home. So you want the house to be clean, the kids to be away and supper on the table. But the main thing is going to be the attitude. Spend a few minutes with him, recharge your own batteries. Cause when your batteries are, are low, you're gonna be snappy and you're gonna be in a bad mood, right? So spend a few minutes of just recharging your own batteries. Don't hit him with any major purchases, any damage to the car or anything <laughs> that he's not gonna appreciate the first nine seconds that he walks in the door, right? And then let him detox from whatever he has going on. Usually a guy wants to run out and dive in mincha or go shopping or whatever the case may be and make sure that you have a set, like time, I'm very regimented in my schedule, but like, I don't know if everybody is or isn't, but whatever works for you, you have to have a regimented, if it's not daily, it's at least like five times a week where you're going out, you're having, it doesn't have to be an hour, but an hour is like a pretty good amount of time. I think that couples should be spending together with no distractions, not watching a movie, you know, not going to the movies, something where like, you feel like, wow, this was quality and we're actually bonding with each other. And you had said, recharge your own batteries. How do women do that? Well, first you have to identify what's draining your batteries, right? If it's your children, right? If it's your job, you know, whatever the case may be. And then you have to obviously take out the bad and then add in some good. Like, you know, everybody has their own life. Everybody has their own life, their own schedule. They know usually what it is. The people around them, it might be, you know, it might be family. It might be a job. It might be your children. Sometimes those things are good, but a lot of times you just, you need a vacation, you need a break. Or again, a lot of times you say, I, your husband comes home. You could even have, you can make this up. Like, I, need, I know that I need an hour. There's one guy, he told me once a week, his wife wants to go, they have a pool. She likes to go swimming for like an hour. Doesn't want to know that they have children for that hour. Doesn't want to know about work or anything. And that's her way of like recharging herself. And then it lasts her for a few days. So everybody has to find their own life. See, the beauty of people is that we're so diverse. It gets people very nervous, but it's really beautiful because so many people have different strengths and so many people have different personalities. You have to find what works in your life. You're right. Some people, the women are working twice as hard as the men or twice as long as the men, and they need that appreciation. But a lot of times, if it's not forthcoming, then you are smart enough to bring it into your marriage. Like in what various ways? I mean, this is very practical and and the whole thing about attitude adjustment and that it's an easy, you know, you just have to take a left or versus a right or whatever. That is just 
uh, so relieving. It's like, oh, what a gift. So maybe Rabbi could give us a little bit of um, uh, um, examples of choices that women have in front of them and what the wrong choice would be and what the right choice would be. So, okay. So let me tell you like this, when people are dating. So like we mentioned in the beginning of the show, right? I do a lot. I didn't start off really focusing on dating, but then as I was talking a lot about marriage, so obviously dating for marriage is, you know, is, is the natural segue. Okay. So when a lot of people, when people are dating, I always tell them that a question, which has a lot of potential to uncover a lot of things about a person is just simply their daily schedule. So it sounds like an innocuous question. I think that's a word, right? There's really not much, there's not much to it. Like, just tell me, how do you spend your day or how do you spend your time? And when you're able to like put it together, you find like, what time does a person get up in the morning, right? What type of job do they have? Do they seem like they're fairly intelligent or are they working like a lower end job? Um, What do they do on their free time? Uh, Do they spend a lot of time with family? So just by asking that one question, you could spend an hour like, getting a pretty good picture of the person that you're, that you're dating. Right. So I think it's the same thing when it comes to a relationship, like figure out, take your literally pen and paper and just scope out what is your daily schedule. And I do this with a lot of couples. I say to them, let's talk about your day. So they get up. Okay. She takes carpool in the morning. He gets up early and he gets the, takes the train to the city, whatever the case may be. So it's like, okay. So according to your calendar, you have no time for each other. So imagine I told you that time with each other means your phone is charged. So now for all these hours, your phone is away from the charger. It is going to die. So that is why your marriage seems like it's on the rocks, but it doesn't have to be because if you came home 20 minutes early, twice a week, then you could have some more time for each other, right? If instead of him, you know, taking a course that has four classes a week, he took three classes a week or whatever the case may be, you can make that work. But I also want to tell you that it's not, let me tell you something, okay? When I was, when I came back to America, so I, I went to Staten Island where I was assistant rabbi and I was getting up at the crack of dawn. I'm not like a morning person. I was getting up at like five 30 in the morning and I, I had the craziest schedule and I was in, I was in school for, I was in school for accounting. I was working in, in, in my firm and I was assistant rabbi. I, I was literally running 23 hours a day. I mean, we're talking nothing. I was running myself like sick, how little energy I had. And when I would come back from school, which was like an hour drive from my house, every single time I would come back, I literally had no energy. I had to like pick my foot up with my hand just to like get my foot in front of the other foot. And I want to tell you that every single time that I did that, that I came home and I was falling apart every time my wife would greet me at the car. It could be one o'clock in the morning. She stayed up and she would be standing there with a cup of water or a drink or iced tea. I like iced tea. Right? And she would sit there and she would say, here you go. And you know what she said to me then? Nothing. Because she knew that I needed just a few minutes just to recharge my batteries. And I would sit on the stoop with her for like 10 minutes and just get my breath and just get my energy. And then she'd say, okay, you ready to go inside? Yeah, go inside. Okay. And we did this for a couple of years. But that, that quality, knowing that we were sharing our lives together, that, you know, if you look at my schedule, you'd say that's impossible. There's no way that your marriage is good. There's no way. You just don't have a lot of time. On Friday nights, when we didn't have guests, we would stay up till three, four, five o'clock in the morning. Our meals went for hours and hours and hours. We'd go on walks with each other. Friday night was like our, our night of the week. That like we finally didn't have school. We didn't have all the, all the chaos of the regular world. You need to sit down with a pen and paper and say, the phone has to charge. Your emotional batteries have to charge. It doesn't have to be long, but it has to be consistent. And again, everybody has their own life. So it can't say you should do this and you should do that. Some people, they need guidance. They need somebody to talk to. But at the end of the day, when you, when you plug it in and you realize like we're living a joint life, it's us, it's we. When I got my certificates, I was like, on my CPA, it should say my wife's name. She worked just as hard as I yes. did. You know and I mean? by the way, Leia, that our audience is like basically saying the next class needs to be the marriage pro herself, the wife. We need to have her on the show. <laughs> she <laughs> she sounds, she she do sounds it. like she nailed it. Yeah, like yeah. she nailed it. That's incredible. So how did she do that? I, th- that's what I would like to know. How did she, how is she... Right. You know, meaning, was that something she saw in her own life that she mimicked or was that something she naturally came to on her own? My, my wife, 
I don't, I'm going to get very emotional if I talk about her. I, re- I really am. Um, I, I really think you should have like a, like a, a follow-up just with her. She's Baruch Hashem, Leonor, she's a very, very, very special woman. The one thing that my father-in-law told me when I got engaged was he said, I, I guarantee you, you're going to have a happy marriage because your daughter, my daughter, you know, your future wife is she learned how to be dedicated a hundred percent to her husband. And I think that's what it is. It's dedication. And it's understanding that there's the opposite of a good marriage is a coexisting marriage where I'm doing my thing and you're doing your thing. And the opposite is just that you're, you're, you're one, your husband has a business deal. You text him, hope it goes well. I'm davening for you, you know, like little things where you just connect his life with yours and your life with his, it makes, it makes your day one. You know, you say, I just picked up the kids, Baruch Hashem, they're doing well. I went to the doctor. This is what happened today. So he comes in the door. There's like a connection when he's running between meetings, he's able to like feed off of your day and you're feeding off of his day. If he appreciates it, if he doesn't, then it just becomes naggy. Right. But let me ask you, because, uh, you know, this is this is nice if in, in all else being equal. But I have a lot of women that say my husband is, is I don't want to use the word mean, but mean, <laughs> you know, like my husband told me that, you know, I, I need to lose some weight. And my husband also, you know, my husband said, um, uh, you know, that I'm not as good of a cook or as my sister, uh, uh, his, my sister, his sister, whatever it is. I mean, there, there's a lack of, 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 of a character trait that people are living with that all else being equal, you know, you know, in, in, in a ideal world or whatever, it would be fine. Okay. So whatever you try and be there and be there. For, but when you're building, when, when you're trying to do that, when you've got resentments and you've got anger, and I mean, I speak with yeah. women very deeply on, you know, and they tell me they're, they're, they're things that it, it's so hard to rise up to have the motivation to be there for somebody who has hurt you. So how do rabbis? Yeah. So, okay. So I deal, I deal with, you know, a lot of couples in that, in that realm as well. So what tends to happen again, I'm sure you've seen this in your experience is that as the years go on and as the resentment builds, they start putting up walls because they don't want to be vulnerable and they, they don't want to expect that compliment. They don't even expect it anymore. They're just like, you know, behind this like wall and it's very hard for him to, I don't need it, you know? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. But okay, so what I do when I sit with couples, I say to them, how old are you? Whatever the age is, right? I'm 50 years old. Okay, great. So you got 70 years left on this planet, okay? Do you want those 70 years to be blissful or do you want those 70 years to be miserable? In order to make this work, we have to start taking down brick by brick and then start putting in what needs to be put in. So the way I work with my couples, for example, and you could do this at home, anybody could do this at home, is... Every day, you have to start giving your spouse three things that are notable, three things that are notable. So uh, a, a husband, again, it works both ways, meaning the husband has to give and the wife has to receive. So the, I, I, get, I get dozens and dozens of texts and e- WhatsApps and emails every day where people tell me the three things that they did for their spouse. So and the wife on her side receiving and being a wife who she's ready to accept and she's trying to work on like taking down those bricks. So for example, um, for some couples, it might be as simple as taking a five minute walk or, or going out for iced coffee or whatever the case may be. For some of them, it might be expression. You know, he finally wrote her a note or every day he, he pens something to her where he's just trying to like learn how to be expressive in a way that she's going to appreciate. It might be by, and I'm telling you, marriages are not built. It's not mountains. It's, it's, it's those 30 seconds, those 45 seconds that that makes the difference. So I, I mean, you're right when it, when there's a lot of toxicity in the air, it, it's hard because they put up those walls and then you got to start taking those walls down, but you have to feel safe. And the only way that that's going to happen is if the guy understands and the woman understands, it's like a pitcher and a catcher, right? It, it, the guy's not going to pitch if you're not catching and vice versa, right? So you're right. A lot of times those walls go up, those walls have to slowly come down brick by brick. And when it does, it accelerates the process so much. I can't tell you how many couples I've worked with. They're married 20, 25 years, 30 years. And after like a couple of weeks, they're like, oh my gosh, we were so stupid. Like if we would have known how easy it was, right? We could start trusting each other. We could start respecting each other. It accelerates the process so much. So it's, it's not rocket science. It's just about having the fortitude to be able to, to do that. We have a question. It's just, but- it's just so sad. People are saying it's just so sad because- 
when you're first dating or whatever, or even growing up, you, so many of us don't see that. So it ends up like, it seems like Rabbi Epstein's wife, like her father said, she must have had really good role models, role models showing her that. And I have a friend the same who her role models, her parents literally live that. Like her mother worshiped her father and her father worshiped her mother. They were like literally king and queen in the house. Everything was on them. That was what she was like. Every part of her, that was her being. So when she got married, she fell so easily into that role versus someone who, let's say, didn't have that and also has the baggage now of just unraveling all this stuff. Yeah, I want to talk about baggage. That's very good. That's where I was going next with this. You read my mind three. But I also want to explain for our viewers that uh, Rabbi had talked about the giver and the receiver. And I just want to say that, you know, there's a Gemara that talks about the husband is the giver and the wife is the receiver. And uh, Rav Moshe Cordovero gives over all bracha comes from Shemayim through the husband and to the wife. And so a lot of women are like, what? I'm the receiver. I want to be the giver. And I'm doing, you know, I'm giving all day long. And yes, you are. But your giving is chesed because everything, uh, you know, the, the husband's the giver. And it's a very deep spiritual concept. We have a lot of shows on it. You can go to ladiestalkshow.com and there's uh, hundreds of shows there for free that you can you can watch about that uh, topic. But it's very important because it's it's very crucial for in, in from what Rabbi's saying to understand that there are different roles. You know, there could be subtleties when, with each individual relationship, but the husband is the giver and the wife is the receiver. And if women ask me, say, if you are standing on one foot lay, if you had to say, what is our Masora? What is our tradition from Harsinai from, from, from 3000 year, years ago? What is our, our tradition for Shalom Bias standing on one foot? It's that the husband is the giver and the wife is the receiver. And that the way that the wife becomes, you know, her full essence of her being is to being the largest receiver she can be, because that's where all the blessing from God comes. So that's a whole deeper topic, but I just wanted to touch on it because Rabbi touched on it. It's very, very crucial to understand that. Now I want to get to when people are coming, and if you have anything to say on that, please feel free, but also when people, so now I might have one or two questions for you. The, sec, the second mm-hmm. issue I wanted to ask is about people bringing baggage to the relationship, that there is, you know, dysfunction or lack of role models or, um, you know, uh, some women I know, I almost can even tell, I'll be talking with someone in deep and they'll be saying about their dissatisfaction in their marriage. And I'll just kind of go, um, I just to ask you a question. You don't have to answer if you don't want, but did you read a lot of romance novels when you were a teenager? And they're like, how did you know that? <laughs> you know, yeah. I can just tell their their understanding of what a male woman relationship is so skewed and not g- geared towards a woman's happiness, certainly not a man's happiness. And um, uh, so with all those misunderstandings and baggage about the their their uh, dysfunctional patterns, et cetera, how does a person overcome that to do what rabbi is? Uh, OK, so it all starts in my mind with the dating process. So obviously we're talking to diff- two different audiences, the ones that are already married versus the ones that are dating for marriage. So when it comes to the ones that are dating for marriage, so I always say there's different, there's about 10 different categories of things that I think people should be discussing, you know, before they get married. And one of them is what should your marriage look like? That should be a conversation piece. Like, what do you expect of me after we get married? You know, or you could give examples, you know, like this is what I saw in my home. Is that something that you're okay with? Or is, what are your expectations? Um, or a certain thing, you know, like if, for example, if let's say it was the night of the Super Bowl and our kid had a big test tomorrow and the kid didn't, you know, need somebody to study, like which one would you prioritize? Or have you ever given, you know, picking up on those cues of like what your marriage is supposed to look like. Um, I'll tell you how I, believe it should look like. I'll tell you that in a second, but (laughs) the the actual, the actual dating, um, the actual dating process, a lot of times will weed out from people who they give good answers and you understand that they're coming from a healthy place versus people who have no clue. They're like, I never thought about it. We'll just figure this out and we'll wing it. But we live in amazing times where people can buy marriage secrets and some other, not too many, but some other amazing books on marriage and they can see podcasts and, and you know all these things where they could get an education to learning what marriage could and should look like. I believe everybody should have a rabbi, 
a Revitson, a mentor, somebody that they look up to that they can actually visualize what marriage should look like. Because a lot of people, they know what it shouldn't look like. They're like, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? They're like, it shouldn't look like the way where I came from, but they, they don't necessarily know like what it should look like. And, and seeing that respect or seeing like a, a, a husband who's like, you know, blessing his kids on Friday night and, and giving his kid, you know, like a kiss on the head or just the, the nuances of how a husband looks at a wife and a wife looks at a husband. These are subtleties that you can't, you can't, I mean, you could read it in a book, but you really can't, you have to experience it. And if somebody doesn't have that, they'd be really wise to invite themselves over, not in like a really clingy way, but like in a healthy way <laughs> to, to, to healthy people's houses so that they can emulate, you know, what it is. But I will tell you that I, I speak a lot about dating and marriage. And I always say that when a guy gets down on one knee and he says, will you marry me? What, what the girl should ask him is, what does that mean to marry? Like, what is that vision? What does that look like? What, what am I signing up for? And the answer should be that it's like two people who are going on a walk. So I, I used to live in Brooklyn, right? So everything's alphabetical, okay? So it's like Avenue M, N, O, whatever, right? So it's like, we're going on a walk from Avenue M to Avenue N. What that means is, is that I take a step and you take a step and I take a step and you take a step. I'm not going to run ahead of you. I'm not going to slow down and go behind you. Our life is a journey and we're going to take this journey together. And a couple that takes that approach, no matter where they're going in life, it means we're going to discuss it before. There's going to be a mutual understanding that we can, you know, voice our opinions. If we disagree, it'll be respectful. We'll have a third party to balance things off of. That marriage has a pretty good chance, you know, of success. And I, I had somebody who sent me an email that she was dating a guy. And the guy got down on one knee to propose. And he said, will you marry me? And she said, what does that mean? And the, and the guy said, it's like a journey. It's like a walk. And you're going to take a step. And I'm going to take a step. And she said, do you ever see Ruben Epstein? <laughs> <laughs> and it's very cute. She sent me a thing like, oh, like yeah, like, we're, like we both watch your serum. And like he, knew what to, like, you know, he knew what to answer, which is very cute. Yes. But in a... But in a real way, in a real way, I think that it's a great metaphor. Like you're not taking a step ahead of your spouse. Like a lot of people that are like, well, I'm a businessman and therefore I'm so busy. Yeah, but where's your spouse? Where's your kids? Like, where's the rest of your family? You know, like you might think you're saving the world, but you're not saving the world if your spouse is not along for the ride. And at the end of the day, they're going to be resentful and your kids will be resentful. And that has to be, that has to be, you know, that has to be spoken out. Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay. We're actually at, at, at the, we, we're, we have like one more minute, but is Sarit has a question and then, and then we'll, we'll no, no, that was just beyond. I'm like, now we just, I'm literally my, my thoughts are like, Oh my gosh, I need to go back to the dating with my husband. We need to start again. The whole process. It's such a beautiful concept. It's something I'm, 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 I'm going to give to my daughters and my sons. It's really, really amazing beyond. Awesome. And so Rabbi, if there was one thing that one last uh, sentence that rabbi wanted to say to give over to people to to have it um uh, everything that we've discussed to go into their heart and stay there what would that be at the, the end of the day it's very simple it's what we said in the beginning there's no there's no any nothing new over here at the end of the day your spouse if you if your spouse is verbalizing that something is wrong just restate what they're saying Instead of listening to the kvetch and the emotion, because what most people argue about is shockingly idiotic. You know that, and I know that. They're not arguing over anything that's substantive, right? They're, they're not arguing like, I want to send my kid to a, a Hasidic school and this one, a modern school. They usually don't have these major, you know, major wars. It's more like how you're treating me and how I feel. And if you literally just restate what your spouse is saying to say, you're doing a great job, and I really appreciate all the hard work you're putting in. And I would just appreciate a little bit more connection. It will, it will change the whole rest of your day and it will change the whole rest of your marriage. And if you stack enough good days together, enough good weeks together, look at that. You change your lifestyle and you change your life. That's it. Rabbi Ruben Epstein, how can they get in touch with you? What is the, what is a website or a, uh, you have a book, uh, 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 but uh, the, you're, it's, it's um, marriagepro.co marriagepro.co not.com marriagepro.co not <laughs> okay, we will rebrand that sometime in the future but it has a jingle marriagepro.co um, and they can reach out to me email at marriagepro.co i try to be very responsive as much as possible 
Um, and this was amazing. This was really so good. I feel like we could do like a hundred part series, right? Like, I know, just, it's really true. Just to get yeah, it. Yeah, but as long as you bring your wife on there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got, we're going to talk after the thing. We're going to talk about that because I think it's a fantastic idea. And on Rabbi's website is hundreds of classes for free on dating and on marriage. And if you're married, uh, tell your dating friends to go there. And if you're dating, tell your married friends to go there. Rabbi, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. It was eye-opening and inspiring. It gave us all a lot of strength. We're very, very grateful to you for coming. Thank on the you Thanks very much. Tonight. Thank you. Thank you. This is Leah Richheimer for the Ladies Talk Show. We'll see you next time. Here's the thing, ladies. If you don't subscribe, you may miss out and you're going to miss some great content. So you need to either like us or follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook, on Torah Anytime, on YouTube, or go right to our website, www.ladiestalkshow.com and fill in a subscription button. And then you'll get every week an update on exactly what's happening. And if you do that, oh, by the way, if you subscribe on our website, you also get 10 tips to have a great relationship. Don't miss it. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks a lot.